And there was another gentleman who was asking me about some of the stuff related to the culture war and uh, how critical theory, these new secularist uh, faiths, uh, as it were, form the role or play the role of religion for some people today. So we can maybe touch upon that. But uh, if I can nest that in something that I thought about and maybe some of you will be interested in, is a uh, a more nuanced, what, what is a more nuanced understanding of identity? So we hear about identity politics, all that kind of stuff. You have the expressive individualism focusing inordinately, inordinately on the self uh, as a kind of very modern conception. But uh, from the Christian perspective, what might it look like for us to cultivate these more nuanced identities in the 21st century, given what we said previously, and uh, take us beyond the madness of crowds to far greater that was Murray? So you want to start with yourself, Paul? Well, maybe... So, I, I was very much raised in a tradition that said, all of life is religious. Because religious questions... Religious questions encompass the basic questions of life. A lot of what's going on now, in terms of a culture war, has a lot to do with identity. Because in, in many ways, your identity is an element of the sacred within you. I, I was talking to uh, James Lindsay. I did an interview with him fairly early on. And I noticed that for many people, they, were, they would deconstruct all sorts of things in their world, but they wouldn't deconstruct the element of their identity that was the focus of their oppression. And I think that then gave insight into the sacred for them. A lot of the content I do on my channel is associated with cognitive science. And cognitive science has grown around the frame problem. When they first started making robots and, and that's, that they wanted to see, they recognized that you can't really see the world without some sort of a value hierarchy. And that value hierarchy will be pulled together by the sacred. And once, once that happens, whether you're conscious of it or unconscious of it, you will have a religious structure, and religious practices will develop, and a, a religion will develop from it. Part of why we don't use that language is because of what happened post-Enlightenment in Christianity, where we started to try to separate the secular from the religious. And, but I think now as we're getting increasingly post-liberal and post-modern, I think increasingly people will recognize that what has passed for secular in the West had deep religious roots, that there were value hierarchies within those structures. And, and then what you see in, let's say, woke religion is just another variant, often of deeply Christian values, sort of taking a new tact, often taking some other element within the created order as sacred, sort of making it a new idolatry. One of the real elements of that, that grows from Judaism, from the Ten Commandments, is that you cannot have a God within the created order. God is above the order, and that if idolatry is anything within the created order, that somehow becomes the highest thing. And so that's sort of how I, I pull together the identity question, the wokeness religion, and, and so I see, I see wokeness as basically a very fragmented, idolatrous attempt to take something and make it sacred, and part of the reason I... I'm not, let's say, a woke alarmist, is because by its nature, they'll never really achieve a lot of cohesion because all of these groups that have something sacred, whether it's sex or gender or race or oppressions of various forms, they'll never gain sufficient agreement because once you eliminate the thing that they are fighting against, let's say, traditional establishment, they'll just fight amongst themselves. And so I, I think in the long term, um, they're not, it's not going anywhere. Would you like to add to that, uh, 
Yeah, um, I think that you only have to talk about identity if you don't have one. Um, I mean, I think that's, it strikes me as quite a significant thing. I mean, there's endless discussion about identity all the time, whether it's your personal identity that you, uh, you yourself have chosen, or your national identity, whether that's a bad or a good thing, whatever. People who I've known in my life who've lived in secure communities and secure places and secure traditions, they don't talk about their identity. My old Irish neighbours who are in their 80s who've lived in that place all their life don't talk about their identity. They wouldn't even know what I was talking about. I mentioned that to them. I mean, they're Irish, they're Catholic, they're, 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 it's not an issue. They just they are in their place. It's a, it's a discussion that comes out of a very broken, fragmented, interconnected, web-obsessed urban environment. In the 21st century, we've got a lot of young people running around going, who the hell am I? And where the hell am I? And what is my culture? And what is real and what is true? And so this kind of frantic scrabble for identity making, and this frantic scrabble to look, to find a part of an oppressed group that you can be part of, because that's paradoxically how you get status now, is by being part of an oppressed group. It is, a, it's got nothing much to do with actual real oppression, which does exist, but it's mostly not what they're talking about. And B, it's, it's a kind of, I think it's a, it's, it's a sign of something that's really broken. I think it's really broken. And as much as I hate the excesses of woke social justice activism, I also understand that I feel really sympathetic to it because it's a manifestation of something that comes out of society and doesn't have any truth in it. Um, there's a real brokenness to it, and there's a, that's why there's so much anger. You know, it's not a, I don't know, you could compare it to something like Gandhi's movement or Martin Luther King's movement, which was a movement for justice, but wasn't based on this kind of angry, fragmented confusion. It was rooted in something, and they said, well, this, is, this is the oppression, this is what is wrong, here's what is right, here's what we have to do, and we're going we're gonna to keep doing this until that happens. That's how you change society. Both of those actually movements were rooted in, in religion of different kinds, rooted, had a spiritual core at their heart. Um, and this doesn't have that, and the social justice movement sometimes feels like the Sermon on the Mount minus God and minus forgiveness, which is a really bad thing. <laughs> it's like, you don't want to hear that sermon, it's a bad sermon. Um, but it's just, it's a, it's a sign of that spiritual emptiness again, I think, that we're so lost and confused, that we invent our own identities. But the solution to that is not to go and take it on head on in a political war, because that's just a trap. It's to somehow talk about where identity and meaning actually come from, which from our perspective is, is a, it's a Christian perspective, but ultimately it comes from God, it comes from something higher, and um, that seems to me to be what's going on. It's just a sign of spiritual breakdown, I think, it's total confusion, um, because as Paul says, the, the, the sort of liberal secular culture that I sort of grew up with is dying. Because it's run, it's run its course. Liberalism was a sort of <coughs> actual, actually a manifestation of Christianity, and it grew in a Christian rootstock. And now it's dying because Christianity has died. <coughs> so we don't have anything to agree on, and so we all fight about identity. And if everyone can create their own identity, we'll fight forever, because we can't even agree on what a man or a woman are at the moment. So there's absolutely no way that we're going to reach agreement on anything bigger than that. So yeah, that's, it seems to me, it's, a, it's like a pathology, it's like a pathology of something that's breaking down. Mm -hmm. And um, I suppose with that in mind, so something John and I mentioned today was James K. A. Smith, the reformed philosopher, he has this notion of kind of secular liturgies, these patterns played, and Jonathan talks about it, <coughs> Jonathan Pajot that is, he talks about why the <coughs> protests, the recent protests, looked so religious, <coughs> and he went into that more complex notion of what is of ultimate import importance that people will go out and congregate even at the risk of catching COVID for Black Lives Matter protests and this kind of thing. Whereas, as you said previously, Paul, the churches were, sh were shut. So even at a prepositional level, they might not understand it, but their embodied actions and liturgical patterns <coughs> reveal that. I wonder if you might say something about that, Paul, and then I suppose maybe as a part two, um, how estuaries groups like that and the, the kind of broader notion of symbolic world that Jonathan talks about might help us to regain that identity alongside the obvious um, identity in Christ that we have, that we might share a space with others who don't share that identity as it were, but get that balance between the two. I, I, I agree with, with what Paul says here. And I, I don't, 
most of the other most of the other identities. So nationalism, of course, in a sense, followed in you know followed the Enlightenment nation building. Nationalism, in some ways, was an attempt to to afford an identity for a group of people that could bind them together and and create a nation. And of course, the United States, sort of being a credo nationalist entity, tried to offer identity. And so America very much has a, a national religion, which is the nation itself. People, people do need something that they can, they can coalesce around. What's been amazing, so I'm going to talk to Tom Holland tomorrow night, uh, one of his early podcasts was about Americanization. It's my first trip to Europe, so I'm learning a ton as I'm here. But I've learned a lot about the UK listening to him. And one of his things was about Americanization, how during the Vietnam War, they were protesting the war. They were having protests against the Vietnam War in Europe when the UK was not in the war. Same thing happened with George Floyd. After the killing of George Floyd, there were protests in London. And it's like, your police didn't kill him. Well, to whom are you protesting? And for what? And whereas I, I think in a very, and I think Tom Holland's book Dominion nicely illustrates this, most stable Western identities if you bring them all down, they are in Christ in a way, sometimes at a very shallow level, even if the people themselves don't know it. Because the values of Christ and the spirit of Christ in many ways has been doing its work through history and through the world. And so that in many ways is a success story. Now, you, as Paul said, you must have an identity and in many ways, your strongest identities are those which are not necessarily self-conscious. They're simply assumed. And religion, as, as Peugeot says, religion will happen. And so when you, when you watch, when you brought, watch people in, in England, or I don't know if they protested here in Ireland, but somewhere, you know, engaging in the liturgy of of demonstration and activism against something that is not connected with their nation state. You know that something far deeper is being engaged. And I, I would say that a, an analogy to this would be a child comes to church, let's say a, a five-year-old or a four-year-old has been in church a number of years, let's say it's a liturgical church, you stand up, you sit down, you say certain words, that child does all of those things. Is that child participating? Yes. Does that child know, in the conscious sense, that most of us um, value highly as participation? No. And I would say the West has, con West has received a sort of religion that every now and then it breaks out. And when you watch strange things like protesting the Vietnam War in a nation that isn't fighting the war, or protesting the killing of a black man in a nation that is not the, where that black man was killed, you say, yeah, there's a religion. But then you have to stop and say, what religion? And that's a far deeper conversation. Would you like to add that? No, I think we've covered absolutely everything there. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, something that I spoke with John about just briefly was from my background in education, uh, building what sort of things you're talking about, Paul, and having taught in different secularist schools, uh, specifically Catholic schools, whatever it was, prep schools of all kinds, and um, noticing the modern presuppositions which underlie those, regardless of the professed allegiance to the Church of England or the Catholic Church or whatever it was, the anthropology that they have, view of what humans are, what humans are for, is very much secular materialist and that is, it, the children imbibe that from a very young age. So one of the things that I thought might be a remedy from a Christian perspective is 
more classical education model, which John mm -hmm. rightly pointed out, has its dangers also, the kind of parochial schooling, then it's, it's doubly difficult in part because the church has lost that authority. People don't want a dictatorial church model, as it were, again. So built into what the cl classical, edu classical Christian education is the lifelong learning, things like that, you have an, an understanding of leisure. So it's, there are some defences against that. You then, you ask the critical questions, but once you have a memory, certain facts at a younger age, with the brain, which the brain is set for the younger ages to imbibe, and that's why we learn languages at a younger age and stuff like that more easily. So I suppose, it's one of the things with the Jewish people that comes across, whenever I read Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, that education is paramount and they hand down this rich tradition coming from ancient Israel to today through their educational institutions. Alongside the wonderful work that they do with the Estuary and stuff like that, how might we hand down what is good in a way that is more uh, integrated, I suppose, in contrast to what's broke off, in what you just described, which uh, Chesterton called virtues run amok. So you take one good thing about the Christian story, but the, it turns dark, or Illich talks about that, the corruption of Christianity, it then becomes a kind of antichrist because it, it takes the best thing and can often make it the worst. There's a lot in that, though, I'm sure, but uh, would you like to speak to that briefly? There's a, there's a lot there. I, I was, a couple of days ago, I was interviewed on a, on a Dutch podcast, and he asked me about what I'd seen in the Netherlands, and I told him, you have Christianity in your stones, and maybe in America we have so many chattering Christians because we have no Christian stones, and um, I, I, think, I think you have a real advantage in this part of the world because... There's so much Christian built into your foundations. And I think if you can give your children eyes to see, um, they can learn in, across in America, especially in the West. We don't have any of that. So um, I think, and I always I often give the advice that if you have a child, you know, what's your parenting advice? People ask for parenting advice. I tell them to be the... Um, be the person you want your child to become. That's the briefest advice I can give you. And um, I think if you want your child to be a Christian, you're going to have to start first. Yeah, I can't really beat that advice. Can I mean, look, I went to a grammar school in the 80s, and it had that sort of classical Christian education. There was a little chapel in the school, and you had to go along every week and headmaster would come along and sort of drone on about the Bible. And nobody, everyone was just throwing paper in the back row. And there was a school assembly every morning and that was Christian and they taught us Latin and all sorts. And no one was paying the blindest bit of attention, including me. Um, because that might have worked once, but given that the society didn't believe it anymore, it didn't really, it didn't matter. I mean, you might have been a real Christian, in which case you probably didn't need that. Or you might, like me and my friends, not have been interested. It was just a thing you had to do. In which case it made no impact. So I think Paul's right. The, the education comes in the home. My wife comes from an Indian family, um, and uh, when she was young, her parents brought her up as a Sikh. And um, she learned all the prayers, and she went to the Gurdwara, to the temple, and she sort of grew out of it as she got older, but now she's going back to it. And she's got something to go back to, but that wasn't in the society. That came from that group of immigrants who didn't even have a temple at that time, right? So they just taught it in their families and taught it in their communities. And Paul's right, it gets modelled, so if you look at your parents and they're terrible brutes, then you're not going to follow their religion, are you, very much, but if, if they're loving people and that seems to be connected to what they're telling you, then it makes sense. So I think now, there's no way that this society <coughs> might, could, could collectively give you a Christian education, because it doesn't believe in it, and even the Catholic Church doesn't believe in it enough to do it in its schools, so it's not going to happen. You'd be better off focusing on that thing that you do at home with your children, that modelling it, that teaching it, that, you know, that's the way to do it because that is, and that's how it was done by the first Christians, of course, in the, in the underground churches and in the home churches. I think that's where we are and it's actually much, to me, it's much more exciting <coughs> and it's much more likely to actually lead to something real, you know, rather than just, you know, I can recite the Lord's Prayer because I learned it at school in the assembly, but no one told me what it meant. 
So <laughs> I've had to work that out now. So, um, yeah, that, that's the difference, I think. So it, it, start, it has to start small, but that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a good thing, I think. Thanks, Paul. And um, I suppose just to strike a more positive note, uh, <laughs> that was a positive. <laughs> <laughs> that was me being positive. <laughs> Best I can do. <laughs> oh, uh, so we mentioned Jonathan Pajot. He's like the, the invisible. <laughs> we're, 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 we're talking about you, Jonathan. So God willing, we'll bring him here next year. That's the plan, anyway. So we'll see what happens. Say no pressure, Jonathan. So um, Jonathan's work. For one example, yourselves likewise, offers me a sign of hope. I've met some wonderful people, both online and in person, present company included, and um, formed friendships, the likes of Daniel here, and myself here, both be really into Paul's work, and hey, Jonathan Pedro talked about it at length. He formed book club, got together, tried to manifest some of these patterns, there go that, that word again, manifest, sorry, it's <laughs> very... New age in some, in some cases, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so the, as I say, that that lends me hope amongst the, uh, alongside the the big picture that Scripture offers is uh, of ultimate hope, basically. So I just wanted to ask you guys then what um, signs of hope that you do see in the culture now, and uh, what's exciting you, what's getting you up and keeping you on this track. So you I'm, I'm, I'm not pessimistic at all. You know, I, I love Chesterton, his, his last chapter in The Everlasting Man. Um, you know, our God knows, you know, Christianity has died, you know, how many times? But he keeps coming back because our God knows the way out of the grave. And, <laughs> and over when we were meeting a little, a little bit earlier in the day, I think if you read history closely, you'll find that these kind of cycles are always happening. Um, the, the inheritance is lost, the, inter the inheritance is squandered, and um, a new generation discovers it and celebrates it and revives it. Um, and, you know, I love, I love so many of Paul's themes, including the apocalyptic, because People, people, when they, when they talk about the apocalyptic, they've seen too many American movies. Because, again, if you look at the apocalypse of John, yeah, it is rough. But it's also joyful because the, because <coughs> the revelation of our Lord is revealed in it. Um, in, a previous, in a previous meeting uh, here in Europe, someone mentioned a time of suffering that they had been in. And, and they talked about the fact that they, they have a strange sort of, it's not really nostalgia, but a, a strange sort of warm remembering a time of great suffering in their life. And I, I immediately connected that, a period in my life when, when things were very hard and very bad, but my relationship with God had never been better. And whether there's a lot of people running around that things are going to collapse, and maybe they will. They, they do regularly. But um, it's, it's so often in these times that people learn, um, is God alone enough? And the answer is yes. And the church, um, the, the, the dead wood of the church gets burned off, and a new church springs out. So, um, Christianity, in my opinion, is the most optimistic religion that, that the world has dared to significantly pursue. And, um, yeah, there'll be bumps, but um, I, 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 have, I have faith. Well, what can I say? What can I add? Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think that Christianity is much more exciting when it's underground, actually. Mm -hmm. Much more exciting, and it's much more alive when it's, when it's a catacomb church, mm -hmm. um, when it's a, 
when it's a persecuted church, or just when it's a church that most people think is weird and don't have anything to do with, which is how it started off and how it's been perceived for a long time. I think that the period we've come out of where Christianity was an establishment faith is quite unusual and probably not very healthy, actually. It's not what it was supposed to be. And it happened for a series of historical reasons, and maybe that was part of the plan, right? Because it spreads the thing in different ways and it achieves all sorts of other things, but actually Christianity and power don't mix very well. Think. Sometimes that relationship is necessary, maybe, but it's always difficult. And I think that the best form of Christianity comes from the underground. It comes from the persecuted church in Eastern Europe, or the early church in, in Rome, when even when the church wasn't being persecuted, it was definitely a socially strange and, and sort of negative thing to do, to be a Christian. It wasn't good for your career. Um, whereas, you know, if you were in Victorian England, you had to pretend at least to be a Christian in order to have a career. <laughs> so everybody said they were, but they probably weren't really. Um, uh, and that was how it went. And um, there's some people who sort of lament the decline of Christendom, and I don't actually, because I think Christendom is in your heart. I don't think it's in your buildings. And I love the buildings, don't get me wrong. I love a medieval church, but, you know, we have to, we have to get back to that place where it's like, like, you just said, burn off the dead wood. The dead wood is being burned off, isn't it? That's how it works. Um, and then we see what's left. But I know, I'm, you know, I think, I think that many things are collapsing and are going to collapse very hard indeed. And I think it's going to be really tough in all sorts of ways for a long time um, because we're coming out of this giant globalized machine age which has destroyed so many things and was never going to be sustained. So that's going to come down. Um, so you won't be able to have faith in that anymore. So <coughs> better, find, better find some faith in something else. And I think, yeah, I think it will be more... It will be more powerful for being smaller and more internal and more local and you know you can already see that happening and the kind of things you're talking about even online conversations are obviously appointed to that there are obviously all these people gathering around you and jonathan pajot i mean jonathan pajot does great work just by bringing christianity to people from a completely different perspective the people who would not normally be christian he's very open to that um and it's just a he's looking at it almost from an entirely different angle and it's just one example of that stuff that's happening there's something going on you can feel it and it's quite interesting and it's not coming from the top down there's still plenty of good people at the top but that's not where the energy seems to be coming from <coughs> so yeah it's quite exciting i think but yeah who knows I know we're, not, we're not in control anyway so <laughs> i just have to go with it yeah that's my optimism see i can do it <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, so we can move to questions now if anyone wants to ask pertaining to this session any of the previous things we mentioned today. Alf, let's go to Sarah Jeff. Yeah. yeah, I just want to add, it's touching on something that has already come up in the conversation there, but I just uh, would like to hear what um, your reaction is to, uh, here's the question, morality in a fake news world, you know, how is it affected and changed by that? I mean, is our moral code something completely that is just a movable feast, that it's like tomorrow, what was okay yesterday is not tomorrow, or what is not okay yesterday will be okay tomorrow? I mean, what's happening? Where, has, where does morality fit in now? Is there a morality? And what effect has the fake news world had on that? I don't know if you've come across some... Um Alistair McIntyre's book After Virtue, very good, written in 1980 I think, and Alistair McIntyre was a, at the time he was a platonic philosopher, I think he became a Catholic later on, and 1980, this is more than 40 years ago, his, the notion that he's putting forward in his book is that we, we're already living after virtue, so all of the Christian virtues built on the Christian faith are still ostensibly in society, but they're hollow, okay, so he gives an example from the book of, um, of the word taboo, and where the word taboo comes from, it was that, it was a Polynesian word, and when the British sailors first arrived in Polynesia, they would find, they found two things that really surprised them. Firstly, virtually complete sexual license, right? Everyone can just have sex with anyone they feel like, and that's all fine. Which, for the British sailors coming from a Protestant society, was pretty exciting, so they were very pleased about that. But they, I took full advantage of it in many cases. But the thing that was more surprising was that in that same society, it was completely forbidden for men to eat with women. Okay, and so they asked the tribal, they asked the king, they said, well, why can't men eat with women? And he said, oh, it's taboo, it's where that word comes from. And they said, oh, right, what does that mean? And he said, well, we, we're not allowed to do it. And they said, okay, why? 
And he said, I don't know, no one can remember. Right? <laughs> it's just what we do. Yeah. And uh, a generation later, there was a new king came to power and he abolished all the taboos throughout society. And there wasn't any immediate uh, effect. But very, very quickly after that, there was a spiralling collapse of the whole culture. Because the taboos had held it together. But by that point, no one knew why they were there. So all it took was one shove for them to fall over. So McIntyre, 40 years ago, is saying that's where we are in the Christian West. We've got all this morality. We don't really know why, though. Like, this is wrong, this is right, that's just what we were taught. But because we don't really believe in the thing that gave us those moral pillars, it doesn't take much for them to fall over. So now we're in a position, I think, where they've all fallen over. But you can't replace them with anything else if you haven't got an agreed spiritual core, if you haven't got a story. So a Christian has a certain set of morality a certain morality because Christ says this is how you should live and you've got the Old Testament as well that tells you what the commandments are so your society is built on that so that's your moral law but if you can't agree on there being anything higher than you then you just invent your own morality and your own identity and your own gender and anything else you fancy identifying as an animal is that it's quite common apparently in America um, I, I hear <laughs> cat gender is the, is the big thing amongst the young uh, so you will, you will get that, because there's no agreed higher story. We don't believe in anything. So that's, <coughs> I think that's where you get the chaos. But then you're going to get a reaction against that, which you can sort of see starting in some quarters as well, where people will say, this can't be real, because we can't just invent truth. So what's the higher truth? So maybe then you get people heading back towards something. But I think that's what's happened. I think the collapse of the Christian story in the West has meant that we... Don't have a, we don't have any agreed reality anymore, nothing at all. Which is where the critical theory stuff comes in, because that's the sort of academic version of that, where we can all just, you know, everything's a social construct and therefore nothing's real, so therefore you can invent anything. And there's no kind of mooring in reality at all. So that's, that's kind of where we are, that's the way I see it. Any other questions, yes? Yeah, so... Um just thinking about what we're talking about and what we're doing here, um, you know, trying to set up these communities and estuary groups um, and all the visions that we have of getting these communities to grow and uh, build the new culture that's emerging. And the culture that exists at the moment that's dying, um, that inevitably will collapse and die. Um, and when that does happen, the groups that are around, um, they'll need to have a very um, strong building force to them, and they'll need to be able to be very creative and proactive in spreading these communities and building new ones. And I think to do that, um, a strong masculine building force is required. You know, the masculine principle of ordering. Um, so, one of the ways of judging, I think, currently, how well we're uh, doing in that regard in building these communities and going against this existing culture is uh, the blowback that that culture gives us. And uh, what I noticed is, for example, even with Jordan Peterson, the culture of the existing powers to be, the current media, the time when they really went against him was when he promoted that masculinity. So it wasn't necessarily the religious stuff even he was talking about, it wasn't his biblical series. It's when he called young men especially and called to that ordering principle. That's where they were really him back and that's where even his interviews that were you know channel four um that's what they perceived as the biggest threat um so i'm wondering how do we balance that from a christian standpoint that masculine ordering principle with sort of letting god do that through us and us being proactive in doing that. So say when Rome was collapsing and the barbarians came in and they were Christianized, they had this masculine vitality to them which allowed them 
to build these Christian societies. So where is that strong ordering masculine principle? Where is that going to come from for us when we're going to have to build those communities? And yeah, so how do we how do we cultivate that in a Christian way, I suppose, without going too far into the pagan side, but also running into the danger of not cultivating cultivating that enough so when the moment does come, we won't have that <coughs> vitality to build. I was a few months ago I was decided to read a bunch of Viking history. I was watching some of the Vikings have been in the Netflix and all of those channels. The amazing things about the Vikings is when the Vikings came through, everybody imagined that the Vikings would just win. And they did a lot of winning. But you would imagine then that 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 you know Odin and Thor and and Freya and all that their religion would just conquer. And in a strange way, the religion of the people that they were conquering conquered them. Think about a neighborhood in which there are two houses and lots of children. In one house, everything is permissible. You can go in there, you can drink whatever you want, you can have a beer, you can have ice cream, you don't have a bedtime, you just do anything you want. And think about another house in which there is some order. And meals are served on time. And there's a prayer before the meals. And, and people, are, people are taught to sit at the table respectfully and eat with a knife and fork. And now, at the, at the first, probably all the kids will go to the house where there are no rules. Oh, this is wonderful. There's no rules here. Let's, you know where all those kids are going to wind up? The house where there's order. Because, well, there's order in the house. There's a mother who loves the children. Meals are set on time. There's structure. It's predictable. And that is also the answer to your question. That... Um, there is, a, there is a reality to this world, and it isn't up for grabs, and even children know it. And so, um, I, think, I think if Christians, Christians in the midst of difficult times, if they can continue to love their enemies, love their, loving your enemies is not advanced Christianity, it's basic Christianity. Love is very difficult, and love isn't giving them whatever they want, but that's, that's how Christians conquer. Has always been that way. Yeah, well, the other thing I'd add to that is just to say, I'm not, I think one of the things I think Peter seems to be wrong about is this notion that masculinity is the ordering principle. Uh, it's, it's not my experience of my wife compared to me. <laughs> there's a certain type of look, there's a certain type of masculine order, but you know, boy, a mother can do a lot more ordering than a father. I that. <laughs> and it, honestly, seriously, and my children would agree with this. And actually, my daughter's quite a lot more orderly than my son. There are different types of order. Um, and so I don't think masculinity is the ordering principle. I think it can be, but there's a feminine ordering too. Uh, and the model for masculinity for a Christian is Christ, who sacrifices himself and loves his enemy. And that's how he defeats the empire. He doesn't go raging into Rome with weapons, which is what a lot of his supporters wanted to do, right? They want him to be the, the Messiah. They want him to get in there and kick ass, and he doesn't. Even when he's resurrected, he doesn't go back to Pilate and say, I told you so, now you're in trouble. <laughs> which, which I would be tempted to do, right? But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. And so if you're actually trying to model yourself on him, the, there's a different kind of order, isn't it? There's a different kind of fight. It's a spiritual war. I was talking to a monk in Romania about this, and he was saying, you know what our weapon is in orthodoxy? And I said, no, and he, he did this with his hands, which is the symbol of using a prayer rope in orthodoxy. You know, this knotted prayer rope, and every, every knot you push forward, you say the Jesus prayer. And so it's just praying, praying, praying. So the war is, is it's, it's the inner war. It's called, um, it's what they call, uh, I've gone out of my head. Um, I've, forgotten, I've forgotten the term at the, the, the most important moment. But it's, just, it's an inner spiritual war, that's the war you're fighting. So the order, I think the order starts here, right? That's the point, which is a point that Peterson makes, to be fair to him, that the order starts here, the whole the famous clean your room thing. Yeah, you do start with the spiritual war, and then that makes you strong on the outside. But that's, I don't think that's inherently masculine. I do agree that society doesn't like men at the moment. I don't think it likes women much either. I don't, I, think think it likes, likes, <laughs> I don't think it likes embodied people who can be comfortable in their body. And, uh, no, I don't, it just likes, it likes robots and drones. It doesn't like any of us to actually be... As, as God intended. 
So yeah, but I think that's the that's the key. You start with the unit order and then then and it goes out. Mm -hmm. Yes, this may have um, the effect of stirring the pot, so to speak. But in terms of wisdom from marriage, um, the estuary. Are you proposing a male estuary and then a female fraternity? Insofar as my experience, we're part of the Catholic Mothers Group, and there's equally a Catholic Fathers Group. The Catholic Mothers are brilliant when we get together, but it repels the Catholic Fathers. And mm -hmm. because we do things inherently different, when, you know, there's nothing as off-putting to men as a crowd of clever women, and there's <laughs> nothing more that we enjoy. So I'm just in terms of like where this goes and where it can take, I just feel that you know, when, from the Catholic faith, where the girls or the women entered, the men fled. You know, when we look at our altar boys and um, our Eucharistic ministers and our readers and all of the rest, and it's just been a wash, the only man left now is the priest. Um, and so, just maybe is there an element of that to complement each other, but also to have separate, healthy kind of space, not healthy spaces, that sounds totally woke. Um, but, you know, in terms of, I think there's a need for a society where men can be men with men. Mm. Um, and maybe that is maybe that's not really correct. Really right. But in terms of just, I notice how you state that it can be if women infiltrate the men's spaces, the men generally head for the emergency exits. So just put it right there. <laughs> if that was the idea of the estuary. I'm sorry, stories. but isn't that a weakness on the part of the men? We're all just people. Men are weaker. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're not. We're, we're, we're back, Kennedy. Women aren't anything. We're people. No, it was a really good. Um, I, I mentioned the men's church just there, which I think is quite important because in, in a small community where I live, um, uh, my, we ended up having a men's shed, um, a small group of people where the men actually feel that they actually have a voice at times. Uh, I belong to another group which is um, jokes and pokers, and it's dominated by the men. So, yeah, uh, it's the one thing that it's, it's, it echoes what. But all I'm saying is, wouldn't it be nice if we could all just respect each other as individuals and interact with No, we do, but we also have to be aware that psychologically, neurologically, biochemically, physically, everything we're very different, and how we do things is very different. I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way. Okay, folks, if we actually take... That's a good uh, impulse there that you have going out for the groups. Once we break into the groups, we'd like to just leave it there for now, if we may. Thank you. Appreciate your d different perspectives there. So, um... One thing I did want to say was regarding that, whether that manifests its, this word again, sorry. So whether that takes place. It's not a bad word. No, it's a, it has its place, it has its place. So whether we have a, I wanted to float the idea out there to you guys about doing estuary group in Ireland or estuary groups in line with what you just said, whether that is mixed sex, whether that is different with both, whether we have all three as it were, so, if anyone is interested, I left a sheet down at the back here on the table. So please write your name down, your email. I would like to play my small part in that. I'm looking to learn more about it from John and Paul, eh, who've taught me with how it's all done to as much as you can within one day. And then I'm going to drop in and join sessions online and so on. So. Not that I would necessarily need that, so if there's people who want to come forth and need those things, that would be fantastic too. So just putting that out there, number one, and then number two, there's a gentleman, Jared, here at the well, back. Sir, maybe I'm obviously not being listening. Uh, what's an estuary degree? Uh, so do you want to describe it first, Paul? It was, that, that was what grew out of trying to create a space where people could begin to learn the art of conversation together and it, it also grew out of the need that I, I loved how earlier Paul said churches need to rebuild trust and one of the one of the ways people rebuild trust is being listened to and so estuary groups are places they're just small groups they're conversation groups there's no there's no Bible study involved there's no message being pursued but it's a way for small groups of people to come together and have conversation about what's most meaningful. And I'm using that, and I'm encouraging pastors to use that in churches, in some ways to rebuild trust in churches, that people who would look at a church and say, I would never go there, they have nothing for me, to realize that there might be something in there for them, that at least there are people who care and who can listen, 
And, and that's a lot. And um, would you be happy to speak about some of the mechanics, John, or would you like to point the folks to somewhere they might learn more about how it's actually implemented then? Right now? If, if you wish, if you're confident to do so. Yeah. Is this not the same audience that I described the estuary experience? Do I get Why do you catch them? See if I'm Ask them some questions, see if they're listening. By show of hands, which are the four categories by which we put topics on the table? Just raise your hand, don't say anything. Raise your hand if you know. The four categories. All right, I'm, that, that's not acceptable. So here we go. <laughs> so the estuary experience is really merely a tiny little tool to make estuary group facilitators feel more comfortable about their role as leaders in the group. It is just a small way to help people put a topic on the table for a lazy person like myself, I prefer to not have to prepare a topic, especially not if the topic is going to get pushed aside because somebody else wants to talk about something else. So there's no point in preparing, no. Dialogue and conversation can happen when people simply put forth the things that are important to them. I believe we're going to have an opportunity to do a little uh, estuary thing, so we're going to modify the normal protocol and instead of saying, you know, uh, intellectually and, and uh, contextually and, and personally and estuarily, we're going to say no. When you sat here and listened to our speakers talk, what jumped out at you that you would like to say more about or hear more about? So then it becomes a matter of uh, going around the room and saying, well, this is the thing that really got got to me, and this is the thing that was important to me, and this is the thing that I found helpful, and this is the thing that, I, that jumped out at me. We're going to put that on the table, we're going to listen carefully to what each person said, and then we're going to say, well, we're going to together decide that that is the angle we're going to pursue in the conversation, and then when there is a more or less a consensus, um, we have our conversation. But that means that everybody's perspective on what happened here today is equally valid as a way to move forward. Or at least heard. Or at least hurt. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, John. Okay, so uh, if we take a break of 15 minutes, or 17 minutes, let's just do 17. So it's uh, 33 minutes past 6 now. So if we come back and then split into groups, if you could make a concerted effort to gather with people who you haven't come with specifically today, and that would be groups of seven. Split yourself into groups of seven. Preferably with being not in the same group as someone else you came with. Thank you, folks. That's good. I'll be really interested. I'm going to float around and hear what they hear what they heard. That's always fun.